Hey guys, Keno Corner here. A couple years ago, I uploaded a few videos to a second channel of mine that nobody really knew about. I uploaded them there because I honestly don't know why I uploaded them there. It was pretty stupid on my part. So two years later, I'm taking them out of the vault and uploading them here for all of you to watch. You'll get to see a version of me in the before times, before all of the optimism, joy, <laughs> and hope were taken out of me. So I hope you enjoy. Without further ado, here's the video. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Kino Corner. Today I'm debuting a new series on my channel, a series that I'm calling A24 Deep Cuts. Basically, it is going to be a series where I take a look at A24 films that weren't successful, critically or commercially. So I won't be talking about The Witch, or The Lighthouse, or Uncut Gems, or Good Time, or any of those films in this series, I'm gonna be taking a look at the movies that you might not have heard of. Because here's the deal, A24 distributes a lot of movies for its size, and they have quickly become one of the major distribution companies in the US within this past decade. And what's even weird to me is that they have garnered like a very loyal fan base. Now, I've known people to be loyal to actors or to directors, but hardly ever any people who are loyal to distribution companies. Like, you don't hear people really saying, I can't wait for that new 20th Century Fox movie to come out. But people do genuinely look forward to A24 movies to come out. Because A24 to them is like a stamp of approval, a, a stamp on the film that shows that it's quality. But like any other distribution company, A24 has its fair share of misses. Now, I'm sure some of these misses are actually hidden gems, but I'm also fairly certain that some of these are just bad. So in the series, I'll be reviewing A24 movies and determining why or why they don't work and why A24 might have released them and also why they might not have seen that much success. So for the first video in the series, I'm gonna be taking a look at A Glimpse Inside the Mind of Charles Swan III. It was directed by Roman Coppola and it stars Charlie Sheen Jason Schwartzman, Bill Murray, Patricia Arquette, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and Catherine Winnick. It was produced by American Zoetrope, the Coppola's production company. Sounds like the formula for a great movie, right? Well, I went into the movie really wanting to like it. It has a 28 on Metacritic, but I was thinking maybe the critics at the time just didn't understand it. Maybe it was ahead of its time. You know, there are movies with bad Metacritic scores that I like, so I thought maybe this could be one of them. I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt. But I gotta say that this is the case of a bunch of really talented people getting together and making something bad. Yeah, the critics were right. You know, not everything we make can be good or can be successful. So I wanna take a look at this movie and see what went wrong and why it's not good. Let's start with the opening. It's a cool opening shot until you realize that it's introducing us to Charles with a psychological examination. It's just such an on-the-nose way to introduce his character. It's a case of telling rather than showing, and it immediately tells us that he has this overactive imagination. I mean, I guess you could say that it's showing us because obviously the psychological examination is kind of happening in his head or he's imagining parts of it, but it still feels demeaning to the audience. The scene also sets up the other characters and the central conflict in a pretty clumsy way. If Roman Coppola had wanted to have a more classic introduction of the characters, he probably should have done what Wes Anderson did in the Royal Tenenbaums. So the central conflict of the film is Charles is getting over a breakup, and in the meantime he's having a temper tantrum disguised as a midlife crisis. What was the cause of this breakup? Well, she found out that he was keeping illicit images of her in a drawer filled with illicit images of all of his exes. You know, this was the 70s, so it's not like he could have a save file on his phone or computer or something. But still, it's like super douchey. Oh, and he cheated on her. Now tell me again how we're supposed to empathize with this guy. It's like he's supposed to be the hero, but he does everything to make us hate him. Now characters can be douchey in the films, and those films can still be great. I mean, take a look at The Life Aquatic or The Graduate or Rushmore. The main characters in those films are less than perfect, to put it mildly. But they're also interesting and funny and charismatic, so we can look past their flaws and see their humanity. Charles Swan isn't funny, he's not interesting, and he's not charismatic. I don't know if that's Charlie Sheen's fault or if that's the script's fault. I think it's both. 
His lack of charisma and overall repellent attitude is highlighted in this one fantasy sequence where a league of women try to assassinate both him and Jason Schwartzman for trying to cheat on their girlfriends. It's done as a parody of old spy movies, and the one positive thing I can say about it is that it gives off some Danger 5 vibes. And anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge fan of Danger 5. That's where the positivity ends for this. I mean, what was the point of this sequence? That they didn't like that their girlfriends would find out that they were cheating on them? I mean, I wonder how their girlfriends feel. But seriously, how are we supposed to root for this guy? Maybe if he's a screw-up, but he's trying to improve his life in another area, we could get behind him. You know, everyone likes to watch somebody change for the better. But that's not the case with him. What he wants is to get back with his ex-girlfriend, and he becomes obsessed with her. No normal person could get behind him on that. And so the story just feels tired and drawn out. Like, we don't care about that. It's boring! Forget her! You're not the only person, Charles! Exactly! It looks like Roman Coppola had a moment of lucidity when writing the script. It is boring. And even worse, it's a student film type plot. It's about getting over a breakup. It's downplaying the bad sides of the protagonist. It's got a weird sort of random humor and it's got bad psychology. But I would have forgiven all of it if it was just funny. But it's not, all of the jokes fall flat. One prime example is Charles gets into a taxi and he's drunk and honestly, Charles is just being Charlie Sheen and he asks the taxi driver if he's selling any drugs. The taxi driver says, no, but my friend sells beluga caviar. So Charlie is just like, all right, let's go get beluga caviar. And they go and they do this illegal looking deal buying beluga out of the back of a car. And Charlie's like, yeah, I got beluga caviar. I know that that's supposed to be a joke but I don't see what the punchline is and I don't see what part of it was actually funny. It just was boring. Actually, the funniest thing in the movie wasn't even a joke. It was something that we're supposed to take seriously. I guffawed at one of the final party scenes where almost every single subplot is wrapped up in quick succession. It was like, boom, 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 it's over and everyone is happy. I was blown away. But the other major problem with the movie is how the story progresses. It oscillates between reality and fantasy. But the fantasy is so obviously fantasy because we know this is just one of Charles' daydreams. So these fantasies don't move the story forward in any meaningful way. I know that they're there to deepen the character of Charles, but they fail at that too. Instead, these scenes that should be the most exciting scenes in the film succeed only in halting the flow of the movie. I found myself waiting for these scenes to end so that the story would just move forward. When we know that these fantasies are just fantasies and they have absolutely no bearing on the story or the progression, we lose interest. We just don't care. In one fantasy that was particularly bad, and not because it was a cheesy ripoff of Cowboys and Indians, but because it was so on the nose, is a fantasy where Jason and Charles are cowboys out in the West and Jason brings up the concept of the battle of the sexes and immediately a tribe of women are attacking them and his ex-girlfriend is the leader of the tribe and she shoots him right in the heart. Come on, give me a break. But these fantasies could be great, you know, I see what they're doing. These fantasies are homages to classic Hollywood genres. You got the Fred Astaire musical, you got the cowboys and Indians, and you got the spy action thrillers. You know, the movie is a love letter to Hollywood. When I first watched the movie, I wondered why it made a big deal of saying that it was made in Hollywood, California, but I get it now, and it should have been more of a love letter. It would have been cool to see the entire film take place in the fantasy world. It could have been this story, or maybe more of a revised story, but seeing the whole progression in the fantasy world would have been super cool. Or if they didn't want to go that route, keep it all in reality, and maybe just a heightened reality. You know, but switching between the two and making it so that they don't really affect each other, well, you know, that just really messes up the pacing. And for comedy, or really any enjoyable movie, pacing is key. Perhaps a part of the film that doesn't really affect the quality as much as the other parts I talked about, but is the most outwardly annoying, is its overall aesthetic. 
You know, the film takes place in the 70s, but it has the aesthetic of like an early 2010s hipster with a bit of a lol so random thrown in. Charlie Sheen's car has an egg decal on one side and bacon decals on the other. His sofa is a hot dog. He speaks to a maid, I guess, in Spanish at some point. And then she talks to him about his pet toucan who then dies 10 minutes later and we're supposed to feel something for it. I don't know. I don't know. The style of the film is much like the film itself. Incredibly indulgent. I normally have a distaste for when critics use that word, indulgent, or words like pretentious. But this is the case of Roman Coppola using his Hollywood influence and money to basically dabble in different Hollywood film genres and string them together with a weak storyline. The ending photo shoot that Charles Swan does is everything and the kitchen sink, which is just an amalgamation of all of his fantasies from the movie, but that's kind of a big problem with the movie. The tone and style is just so all over the place that there's not enough to latch onto as a viewer. It's a mess. But above that, the most self-indulgent part of the movie was the ending in which we see Coppola sitting behind the camera. Like, dude, come on. This isn't meta or ironic, and it's not really that cool to break the fourth wall in this kind of way. Like, what are we supposed to get from that? That the movie's really just about you? I don't know, man. All I got from it is that this is definitely a vanity project. That's why I always found it interesting that this was A24's very first movie. We've come to know A24 as a distributor that releases quality films, but obviously this isn't it. I mean, I'm a big fan of all the people on board. I like Jason Schwartzman and Roman Coppola and Bill Murray, and maybe that's why A24 bought it. They thought that they could get away on the star power alone, even though the movie might not have been that good, but you know what? They might have thought the movie might find its own audience. But the bad critical reception, I think, killed it at its box office, and it only made about $210,000 worldwide. It definitely cost more than that to produce. So would I recommend this film? No, not really. I mean, not unless you're an A24 completionist, in which case it's going to be on Netflix until July 11th, so you have a very short window to watch it for free. The good thing I can say about it is that it's less than 90 minutes long, so it's over pretty quickly. But if you want to watch a film with funny cutaway sequences, watch UHF instead. You know, the Weird Al movie that is pretty stupid, but it's also pretty funny. And if you want to watch a movie about a middle-aged man getting over his ex-girlfriends and ex-wives, watch Broken Flowers instead. You know, the thing about Charles Swan is that what it tries to do, so many other films just do better. If you like this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe, and be sure to hit that bell button. If you like this video, if you like the A24 deep cuts, let me know, and I'll maybe do some more of them in the future. Uh, for the rest of the month, I'll be doing more traditional Kino Corner style videos, but this was fun to make, so I would love to make more, and I will see you all in the next video.